Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today I'm looking at a rather unique product, the Viotech Link Q or Link Touch, which is a brand new portable touchscreen monitor from one of the companies we've been working with for some time. You might have seen our coverage and reviews of their gaming monitors, which I generally think have been pretty good, but the Link Touch is a bit of a different type of device for them. Basically, this is a 15.6 inch 1080p IPS display running at 60 hertz, integrated into a slim, light and portable chassis. It's slim enough to slip inside a backpack along with a laptop or other device, and the idea is you could use this as a secondary monitor or a larger display while on the go. Some of the examples Viotech gave were hooking this up to a laptop for a dual screen setup or a console like the Nintendo Switch for a larger display or even a smartphone. So it seems like a decent concept. And the product itself really does live up to being portable. It's just 10 mil thick, which is around the thickness of a tablet, and the touch model weighs around 770 grams. There's also a non-touch variant available, which is a little cheaper and lighter, but appears to use otherwise the same design. Both come with a nifty magnetic folding stand, which covers the display during transportation and prevents it from getting damaged, while allowing the monitor to be positioned during use at a number of angles. I didn't expect the stand would support a range of angles, so that was a pleasant surprise. For pricing, the touchscreen model I have in for review today is $250 US dollars, and the non-touch model will retail for $190. Both will be available through standard retailers like Amazon starting on August 15, I believe. So this isn't going to be the cheapest addition to your portable setup, and it's a little more expensive than some of the no-name options on Amazon right now, at least for the non-touch model. But at the same time, it is cheaper than something like the Asus Zen Screen Go, for what it's worth. As for the design and build quality, look, it's quite impressive and well built. The thin metal body with glass on the front and rear is sturdy and has very little flex to it. There are slim bezels around three sides with a bit of a chin, although that's fine in my opinion. The magnetic cover attaches easily and it too feels well made with its rubberized finish. The whole thing has a premium feel to it, which I always appreciate. The downside here being what Viotech calls a mirror finish. Basically, this is just a reference to the black glass used on both the front and rear. This is a bit of a design trend in phones these days, for example, but it's perhaps not the best choice here. The black glossy finish is a huge fingerprint magnet, and having so much glass could present an issue if dropped. There's a lot of surface area to crack or damage. The included cover will help stop some of this, but even with the cover attached, there's still an exposed area on the back. The setup process for using this portable monitor is either going to be easy or complicated depending on your host device. There are three ports on the monitor, a mini HDMI port, a USB-C data port, and a USB-C power port. There's no visual distinction between the ports, you'll just have to know the top one is for data and the bottom one for power as far as the USB-C is concerned. If you have a device that supports DisplayPort Alt mode over USB-C, chances are you will be able to use this monitor with just one cable. You plug it in and all of the display signal, touchscreen data and power are delivered over this single cable. Many modern laptops support this sort of communication, and given this display uses only up to 8 watts of power with 100% brightness in my testing, most USB-C ports should be able to provide this. For devices that can't supply enough power, you'll need to hook up the second USB-C power port to a USB power brick, which is not included. Viatech recommends a 5 volt 3 amp charger. This is the configuration you'll need for something like a smartphone or if you're hooking up over mini HDMI. The good news is the monitor supports USB power delivery 2.0, so the monitor can charge your smartphone or other device in this configuration if you use USB-C DP alt mode for the display signal. There's a few other connection oddities, for example, if you want to use this with a laptop over HDMI, you'll need to use up to three cables. The HDMI cable for display signals, a USB-C cable for touchscreen data, and possibly a second USB-C cable if your laptop can't supply enough power over USB. Then for something like a Nintendo Switch, if you use a 5 volt power source, you'll get a 720p signal, whereas if you use a 15 volt source, you'll get 1080p. All up, not the most straightforward setup for some of those more unique combinations. Luckily for me, I had no trouble using a single cable setup most of the time, and that worked fine. No flickering or other issues, and the touchscreen is very responsive and accurate. I was hoping this wouldn't be a cheap, crappy touchscreen, and it's not. It's quality, and it's easy to use with the tablet-like coating on the display. On the left, we have a headphone jack, a power button, and a rocker that controls the on-screen menu. Yep, there's still an OSD here with some basic color controls and other functionality, although don't expect any serious features in there. It's just a limited selection of controls. There's also built-in speakers, which are absolute garbage. You'll definitely want to use headphones here. 
So far, everything has been relatively fine. Decent build quality, great stand cover, responsive touchscreen, single cable connectivity works fine. It could be an excellent portable monitor for a variety of situations, but where it falls apart is in the actual display's performance. The biggest issue by far is the color gamut. Just 65% sRGB coverage is quite frankly inexcusable for a display sold in 2019. sRGB has been the global color standard for these types of displays for decades, and basically every even remotely decent monitor you see will support near 100% coverage in 2019, even budget products these days. Only offering 65% coverage is, in my opinion, an unforgivable mistake. What this sort of gamut means in practice is undersaturation of colors and a general washed out look. I could maybe forgive this sort of thing on a dirt cheap $200 Chromebook with a 1366 by 768 display, but this is a $250 standalone display product. I've tested $100 monitors that deliver full sRGB, so really this isn't good enough. To make matters worse, I know for a fact that there are 15.6 inch 1080p 60Hz IPS display panels out there that provide 100% sRGB coverage because I've tested plenty of laptops that use them. Now, I don't know for sure what happened during the design process for a product like this, but my first thought is Viatech have cheaped out and chosen a budget panel rather than something decent. And that's a real shame because I could see this sort of product being very useful for productivity on the go. Say you wanted to edit videos and get a bit of extra screen real estate on a larger monitor, or do some photo editing and be able to see things a bit clearer. With a low color gamut, this is really not possible. Even if you just wanted to view movies, they're not going to look at their best when the gamut is capped to 65% of the standard SDR spectrum. Now, I could go through and show you all the color performance charts and so on, but the reality is it's never going to be sRGB accurate if it can't show all the colors in the sRGB gamut. Take these saturation sweeps. You can see that we're getting under saturation, and at the top end for, say, greens, the dots begin to bunch up at the high chromacity range, which basically means the top end values are clipped. The only area we can really correct with calibration here is grayscale performance. Out of the box, things are a bit wonky, especially the gamma curve, but nothing outrageous. Through calibration, we can improve that to a sub 1.0 delta E and a perfect gamma curve. But again, we can move across to saturation sweeps and from the 80% mark or so, we still get intense clipping at the top end. So yeah not great. The other area of concern is response times. Viotech claim a combined rise and fall time metric of 30 milliseconds, which is pretty slow by today's standards. I recorded a grade to grade average of 20.07 milliseconds, and basically it's just a sea of red here in the response time chart. Great that we don't get much overshoot, bad that only 25% of transitions fall within the 16.67 millisecond transition window for 60 hertz. What this means is there is a lot of ghosting and smearing when viewing anything in motion. That might be fine for more static content and stuff like web browsing or photo editing, if the panel's color performance was good for photo editing, but poor for video playback or gaming. And gaming is one of the advertised use cases here, so that's not good. Really, this panel performs like one of the very early IPS monitors to hit the market, which were very slow. There's also no overdrive functionality here, so there's no way to speed this device up. Input lag is also poor. I recorded 31 milliseconds of latency from the USB-C output of my RTX 2080 Ti. Normally, I test with DisplayPort, so there could be a bit of a difference introduced there from using USB-C instead. But still, that's a not a good number, especially for gaming. It's really those couple of problems that prevent the monitor from performing well, because it does well in the rest of our performance test. 230 nits from a portable monitor down to 215 nits while calibrated, I think is quite good, and considering I normally use my laptop at below 200 nits, that's fine for me. Minimum brightness of just five nits as well could be useful for usage in a dark room. A contrast ratio of 1100 to one when calibrated is also above average for an IPS monitor. Finally, we have a look here at uniformity, where this monitor also provides solid performance. It's not outstanding, but it's decent. And when you pair this with excellent viewing angles, I think some aspects of the performance here really are quite promising. Now, for a lot of products, when I get to this point in the review, I end up talking about the pros and cons, then the price, and end up making a value judgment on whether you should buy it. For a lot of things, the actual product itself is fine, but the price is too high. So we end up saying something like, there are no bad products, only bad prices. 
But for this Viotech Link Touch monitor, I actually think this is a bad product. Its poor color gamut prevents it from being a decent second screen option for productivity or creative work on the go. And if you were planning on using this as a portable monitor for gaming or movie watching, the undersaturation problem you get from the low gamut is compounded by bad response times. In many ways, this display performs like an IPS monitor from 10 or more years ago. So yeah, it's really not great. This is a real shame because I think there's a decent framework of a good product here. You get decent brightness and contrast, excellent viewing angles, and a good design. It genuinely is a very portable monitor. I can see people easily slipping this into a backpack. When paired with a modern laptop, it should work over a single cable. The touchscreen as well is really good and very responsive. But I just can't get past some of the performance problems, especially given you're forking out $190 for the non-touch model or $250 for the touchscreen version. That's a lot of money to get a mediocre experience. To make matters worse, as I said earlier, I know there are panels available that could have been used here that would have fixed at least some of the issues. Whether they weren't used for engineering reasons or cost reasons, I'm not sure, but it's definitely disappointing. Now, I don't know if any competing products offer a true 100% sRGB gamut, which is my main sticking point here because, well, I haven't tested them, so I don't know for sure whether they cover that gamut properly. But this equivalent model from Verzen or Ver Verzen, something like that, a company I've never heard of, uh, they claim to offer an IPS display with 100% sRGB coverage and five millisecond response times. Given it's also cheaper at $170 on Amazon, it's probably worth taking a punt on. And there are plenty of similar units available through places like Amazon and eBay as well, if you're in the market for something like this. That's for the non-touch model though. If you are after a touchscreen enabled unit, then Viatech does offer one of the cheapest options, if not the outright cheapest. If the touchscreen is the absolute key feature here and you don't really care about anything else, then yeah, I guess it could be considered. But I still think the flaws here are too serious to recommend spending $250 on for most people, whether you're a more casual user or a content creator. So that's it for this review. Bit of a disappointing product, to be honest. Not often I review something that I wouldn't recommend, but I guess not everything can be good. Consider subscribing for more monitor reviews. We also have our Patreon page where you can sign up to get cool perks like access to behind the scenes videos. And I'll catch you in the next one.